Hey, this is Ali Su. Welcome to Pharmacy Entrepreneur TV. If you are a past, present, and future pharmacist, and you want to create a business and life you love, this is the show for you. Today, we're very excited to have Jared McMorg on our show. Jared is an Australian pharmacist. He has in-depth experience of community pharmacy as well as the broader health sector. He wears many hats across a variety of organizations, including Hepatitis Victoria, Harm Reduction Victoria, Chronic Pain Australia, and the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia. He was also recently involved with the pharmacy broads discussion around pharmacists prescribing and the implementation of voluntary assisted dying in Victoria. Jared is particularly passionate about seeing greater collaboration between pharmacists across settings and between pharmacists and other health professions. In 2014, Jared was elected to the Victorian branch committee of the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia. And in 2015, he was elected to the vice president. In 2019, Jared was voted as one of 14 most influential people in pharmacy. Jared represents pharmacists and the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia on a number of professional committees and in advocacy roles with external stakeholders such as RMIT University, Pharmacist Support Service and the Victorian Department of Health and Human Services. Let's welcome Jared McMorg. Hi Jared, how are you today? Morning, well thanks. We're so excited to have you on the show to learn more about insights in Australia pharmacy and the future of pharmacy industry in Australia. Nice. We know that you have 20 years of experience as a community pharmacist and you're one of the most influential people in pharmacy. Right. Sure. <laughs> yeah, there was certainly a list that was put together that had my name on it, but I, I don't know if that's accurate, but uh, it certainly came up at one time. So yeah, I guess so, but not really. <laughs> Very modest, but you're involved in so many different organizations, associations, and, and I'm just dying to know your involvement, your thoughts on uh, all these parts um, of association and also our pharmacist role in these associations, yeah. in these aspects. So just sure. before we started all that, can you tell us about your pharmacy journey? Yeah, okay. Okay. So um, I started pharmacy in 1998 at Charles Sturt University, uh, Wagga Wagga. And so four-year degree, it was the first four-year degree in Australia. Um, unfortunately, it no longer exists. It got, it got transferred um, to Orange, I think it is in the end. But um, yeah, there's no longer a Wagga Wagga course. Uh, I worked in country New South Wales for 10 years. And then I worked in country Victoria for five years. Um, and then I purchased a pharmacy in Melbourne, which I sold in December of last year. Um, in the meantime, I was elected to the Victorian branch of the PSA. Um, I... I had been a member of the PSA for quite a while in New South Wales and then stopped because I'd had some issues with um, responsiveness to the needs of rural pharmacists at the time. Mm. Um, then when I moved to Victoria, I rejoined and, and found that it was um, very uh, more open to rural distribution of, of access to CPE and things like this. This is back before internet was really very useful for these things. Um, and then they had unification. It's become a lot more... Um, uh, a lot more equitable, I guess. And then from being on the board, uh, an opportunity came up to take on a, a, a role within PSA. So I sold out of the pharmacy and, and went to become a uh, an employee of the PSA. And now I work in the projects division. So that means we work on you know implementing and, and working on new areas of pharmacy practice um, at you know based on contracts we might get from the primary health networks or from state and federal uh, health departments. So within the PSA, I know that we have a list here of your member of these advisory group, digital oh, yeah. health projects. So can you tell us a bit more of the project and what you're actually working on? Yeah. Okay. So some of the projects that, that my group is currently working on at the moment within the PSA. So we've got a division 
Um, things like pharmacists working in GP clinics. We, we're working in some projects sponsored by primary health networks to develop the business case. So the evidence already exists. We know that pharmacists are very effective working in a GP clinic, but we're trying to help build a business case so that GP clinics can say, okay, great, if I employ a pharmacist in this manner, this is how it's gonna work out for my business. Um, we've also got a, a project that's looking at a similar thing with pharmacists working in um, aged care facilities as well. It's a little bit earlier on in the process, I guess, because um, it's a bit more difficult to make a business case for that because um, aged care facilities are vastly different. In you know, you have a huge organisation that holds multiple sites, and then you have a, a nice little country town with 50 beds, for instance. So big differences there. The main project that I've been working in is. Um, communications and awareness raising around the electronic prescriptions, which are mm. currently legal in, in Australia, but uh, uh, in various different processes of becoming available for pharmacists to operate at the moment. So, yeah, wow. they're, they're the mainline ones, I guess. There's a lot more, but they're all sort of smaller pieces that aren't as interesting to talk about, I guess. Mm. Well, I guess one of the questions for pharmacists uh right now will be how did you get into this project and if pharmacists have an idea of something that wanted to voice yep. who should they go to okay so i i transitioned i guess from working in community pharmacy through to uh, working in the ad advocacy sector i would call it um so to get a bit a bit of broader overview i am uh, a member of hepatitis victoria of the board. I'm a member of the board of Harm Reduction Victoria, which is a, a, a group that advocates for people who use drugs and to ensure that they're, um, they're dealt with in a health manner rather than a legal manner, I guess. Um, and I'm on the board of Chronic Pain Australia, of which I'm the president as well. So I'm, I'm involved with a, a bunch of different things. I'm also involved with a mental health um, mm -hmm. pharmacist support service as well. So I guess that was a bit of a journey as well. I started off by um, becoming involved online in discussions. You know, today it's Facebook, but previous to that, there was a thing called the Ausfarm List, and there was also uh, the AJP and Pharmacy Daily and many other media outlets online where pharmacists and other health professionals sort of discuss these issues. Um, and uh, I guess I gained a bit of a reputation, not always a positive one in having an opinion about certain things or different aspects of, of pharmacy practice. Um, the, the best way to get involved with boards, for instance, health boards and charitable health boards is to show an interest to apply for roles in areas that you have an interest in. So I've always had a, a, an area of, of interest around stigma. Mm. So the idea of people experiencing stigma in their healthcare has always been something that I've been very focused on. Um, and that's come a lot through. Um, when I was working in country Victoria, I was involved with uh, a fairly large, for a rural town, a fairly large Maytod service delivering both methadone and, and Suboxone, Subutex first and then Suboxone when it came out. And there was a clear, um, a clear disconnect with the level of service and the stigma experienced by one set of people who was uh, being serviced from one surgery in that town and another set of people who were being serviced by a different surgery in the same town for the same service. So both accessing METOD, um, but vastly different experiences for these, um, for these clients. They were experiencing, one, one was basically getting holistic care. If you come and see me at this surgery, then we'll do your, um, your substance use disorder, but we'll also look after your, your health conditions. Mm. Um, the other was not, the other one was like, well, I'll, I'll help you with methadone, but if you need anything else, you need to find another doctor. And the way it, the way permits work in Victoria, it was really difficult in a small country town for somebody to be told that, well, you need two separate doctors, one for everything else and one for your um, substance use. Disorder. So I, I had an, uh, an interest in stigma from that point of view very early in my career. And since that time, when there has been opportunities to be involved with organisations that focus on stigma, I've, um, I've tried to become available for that. So mental health, liver disease, which focuses on hepatitis C especially, and um, harm reduction for drug use and um, chronic pain. So 
it's a matter of, I guess, getting involved is just a matter of being interested in the first place. And then when you see an opportunity apply for it, you won't always realize that opportunity. But when you do, it's, um, it can be very rewarding and teaches you a lot of new skills very quickly. So uh, speaking of the chronic pain, you're the president of Chronic Pain Australia. Um, so what's your main focus at the moment? So Chronic Pain Australia is, a, is what we call a grassroots organisation. That means it's a small number on the board. We, it's got one employee. Um, it is, its mandate specifically is to focus on messaging that comes from people who are experiencing pain through our, um, we, we have a closed forum that members are uh, able to discuss anything they want. We have social media as well. So pain is a big issue and it has multiple um, advocacy groups throughout Australia, but each one represents sort of a different aspect of that, if that makes sense. So there are faculties of pain within uh, medical groups that represent the, the points of view of, of medical practitioners and other health professionals. And there is also Pain Australia, which is sort of an all encompassing you know, it looks at government policy, it looks at healthcare providers' points of view, and it looks at consumers' point of view. The, the place for Chronic Pain Australia is that we represent specifically the voice of people in pain, and that's the only message that we focus on. So despite myself as a health professional being part of that board, the messaging that we put out there comes directly from the um, communications that we have with our members. Um, so a, a really good example of that would be when um, codeine was being scheduled from Schedule 3 to Schedule 4, our organization's message was that um, I, I, as its own change, that's not really appropriate because people are going to be left without um, access to relevant treatment. Um, and that was definitely the message coming from our members. At the moment, we've got a similar issue. There's been some recent changes to um, the requirements for prescribing of opioids. Mm. And again, as in the lead up to that change, our members were expressing significant concerns that that was going to lead to red tape and doctors uh, suddenly stopping people's uh, access. Mm. And that has occurred. In addition to that, there were some technical issues where people couldn't write prescriptions because the software didn't have the new requirements within it. So um, those are the kind of things that, that Chronic Pain Australia does. And our focus is mainly around you know, the, the experience for people in pain. Right. So um, I read an article you wrote on Sydney Health Fund uh, about stigma around the chronic pain. And also you mentioned briefly on medicinal cannabis and the use of it. What are your thoughts? So medicinal cannabis is an interesting one because it's not, um, you tend to get people who will talk about medicinal cannabis as either being, well, this is pointless. It does nothing. Let's, let's forget about it. And you'll get others who are like, no, no, this is the answer to everything we need to make this available to everybody right now for everything. It'll just fix everything. And neither of those is accurate. Um, Chronic Pain Australia has a position on that. And it happens to be my own personal opinion as well, which is quite nice to have them aligned. Um, medicinal cannabis has a place. It's useful for some people. It's useful for some conditions. Um, the issues are that we treat it differently from other medicines. So some of the issues around medicinal cannabis are in place because up until very recently, cannabis itself was illegal and the use of cannabis is stigmatized. People think, well, you only want a prescription for cannabis because you want to get high and that the difficulties in getting access to medicinal cannabis make that statement pretty ridiculous. Um, the, the real place for medicinal cannabis in therapy for conditions like epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, uh, other neurological conditions has been fairly well established. The um, place for pain is probably in some pain control that allows for the reduction in other medicines. So we see this as pharmacists, we see this with um, cardiovascular disease. You know, if you're treating hypertension, you're not going to go with one great big dose of, of a beta blocker or an ACE inhibitor. Uh, you're going to go with multiple medicines at lower doses together. And that's probably what the place is for medicinal cannabis. But we've got these um, barriers that we have to get through to get access to medicinal cannabis. So in Australia at the moment, there is only one product that is TGA listed. What that means is that if you prescribed medicinal cannabis, you, you should be trying that one first by law. That's the way it's supposed to be. You must try all of the listed options first, and then you would go to special access scheme to utilize one of the non-listed products. Problem is that that's expensive and it's a lot of paperwork. 
Um, we also have a problem where individual states require a different, uh, like a separate approval process on top of the federal process. So if I were a doctor writing a script, I'd have to get through the federal system, which is very well streamlined now. And in my state, I would have to go through that health department as well. Um, Queensland's about to change that. They're not going to require that at all anymore. But at the, it's still, you know, a double stage process for something that is, if you were to compare it, medicinal cannabis compared to opioids, um, a lot safer, like dramatically safer, and yet relatively easy to get access to opioids. It's changing, but still far easier to get access to opioids than it is for medicinal cannabis, despite safety. So my position on medicinal cannabis is that it's not the answer to everything, and we should be treating it as strictly as we do. It needs regulation, absolutely. Mm. And it should be a bit more um, balanced. And we're not there yet. We're getting there, I think. Mm. Mm. I know that you're passionate about seeing greater collaboration between pharmacists and other health professionals, as well as Ella Health, specifically in the pain uh, area. Yes, um, yes. Uh, even within the pharmacy, we'll have clinic rooms that if we invite, say, a acupuncturist or invite a physio to come into the room to consult, do you see that as a as a good thing to move forward? Yeah, what's your thoughts on that? Sure. Um, when I first started in pharmacy, I always thought it would be really interesting to own a pharmacy business that was larger than just the standard pharmacy. So having a floor space that was pharmacy space but then employed other health professionals in a in a consulting manner then the government actually brought in a policy that that replicated that to a degree with these um uh, sub clinics they never really took off um partly because it's you know who who actually controls that that um setting um i've so pharmacies that I've worked with in the, over my career have always had a consulting room. So I've been in pharmacy for 20 years. 20 years ago, it was unusual to have a consulting room in the pharmacy. These days, it's unusual not to. Um, we use it for so many things. Uh, throughout my career, the pharmacies that I've managed have had occupational therapists. Um, they've had nurses. We've had I have managed a pharmacy where the owners put in a, an actual GP clinic literally within the pharmacy, not, not what you normally see where they're sort of side by side. You couldn't get into the GP clinic without being inside the pharmacy first. Mm -hmm. I, I have different points of view on that. One of the things is that pharmacists, when you are managing a pharmacy, if you're the pharmacist in charge or the manager or the owner, you are actually responsible for every piece of, of advice given out while you're in charge. That's the nature of the role. So you need to be careful when you're, when you're employing another APRA registered health professional that you are confident that they are actually up to the task and competent. Because if they're not and they give bad advice, you're as liable as they are. Maybe more so, depending on the severity of the, of the issue. Um, on the flip side, I tended to, so when we had an occupational therapist working in a pharmacy that I managed, it tended to be that it, they just never got access to the room that they needed access to in order to provide that service. And other health professionals in the area didn't really understand that they were an OT and they, they weren't getting referrals. They certainly weren't getting referrals for services that they could provide through Medicare. It, it became unworkable for them and so that did, mm. that relationship ceased they ended up opening up their own rooms and we would refer on to them directly mm. um, this is a rural town as well so you know small towns can't always support um somebody like an ot in the first place because it's a fairly specialized allied health role um so i, I sort of got mixed opinions about the viability not the not the um, appropriateness because I think it's completely appropriate to have other health um, uh, professionals working in, in within the pharmacy sec setting, but it tends to be the more generalist the better. So nurses are just a perfect fit, um, but when you have rooms being available um, for other health professionals, it it really needs to be a sort of as a visiting basis type thing. So. Um, 
some good examples I've had work really well in the past have been audiologists visiting to do ear check, uh, hearing checks and um, checks for bone density screening as well. Um, and sleep technicians doing um, sleep apnea, things like that. Yeah. But when you, when you get somebody who is a, a very focused, like a physiotherapist or a dietitian or a nutritionist and things like that, mm. you just don't have the type of setting where it works very well to have them long-term. Um, it's better as a visiting type thing and, and having a mutual arrangement where they have some time and space and you can um, generate increased um, relationships with your clientele by making those kind of services available to them, but not necessarily housing them permanently on a regular basis. Yeah. So the next question is that we are pharmacy entrepreneurs and uh, where pharmacists try to find a way to start our own business without purchasing a pharmacy. I know that you previously owned a pharmacy, but now our new generation don't have the money and don't want to have that pharmacy, physical pharmacy. So I know that many US consulting pharmacists have their online business. They consult, um, they give uh, recommendations to patient one-on-one -on -one online. Um, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that in Australia? So I, I like the new innovative models that I've seen of people who are um, providing a advice service, especially a paid advice service. I think that is a great space to be in. I know that, uh, I believe you've spoken to Anna Barwick um, yeah. previously. She's doing some really, really good work, really, really good work and very innovative. And it's great to see. Um, as somebody who has owned and then sold a pharmacy, I very much agree with the, co the concept of not getting into business ownership through the path of owning a pharmacy business. Uh, it is a lot of hard work. It's not necessarily very rewarding. And it is, the market is very insular. That means that there's only a few buyers. And unless you are extremely familiar with the business that you're going to be purchasing, the, it is very easy to miss things. Um, you know, things can look great on paper and they're not necessarily that way in reality. Um, you know, I, when I purchased my pharmacy, I walked into a situation where we had an agreement with multiple aged care facilities where not only were we providing packing services for free at significant cost, but we were also providing delivery staff to pick up and deliver at the drop of a hat at all times of the day. Pharmacists were expected to be on call in order to make changes to those packs at all times of the day. Now we were open from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. at night, and yet the pharmacists were expected to be available to make changes. This is when I purchased it. Wow. And we were also expected to pay for the facility's um, medication management software and for their trolleys. Now, none of that was part of what you would see in a contract of sale of the business. That was one aspect of, of some of the things. So it is a difficult thing to get into ownership and having to fork out millions and millions of dollars to purchase a business and then find out, well, there's still things I didn't know. Mm. Buying it, buying it outright. I mean, if you went in as a minor partner originally for a pharmacy that you've worked in for 10 years, then, you know, likelihood is you know the ins and outs better than, than anybody else other than the owner themselves. Mm. Uh, or if you get a Greenfields opportunity, like if somebody gets an opportunity to do that, I can highly, highly recommend that. That's really, really a, a good way to go. Um, but buying a well-established business that you are not necessarily familiar with might not be the best um, way forward. Working out the the new niche roles that can be um, um, turned into a business opportunity is um, very interesting. I, I'm not always sure how um, sustainable they might be in the long run because the market needs to decide if they're valuable or not. And by that, I mean, if our client base doesn't see a value in it, then it may be that that, that fails, that business model fails, whatever it might be. Now, that's, that's the heart of entrepreneurship is going out there, making an attempt, learning from that attempt, absolutely, and then finding out, well, actually, the market doesn't support it, so therefore, it just fails on its own, and, which is a shame. It's a, you know, it's a pity when that kind of thing happens, but 
there's certainly a lot of value that people can learn from that. Whether you can financially recover from that, sorry, to make a pop culture reference there to the Tiger King, but if you if you put yourself in a position where you can't financially recover from that, then that you know no matter what the learning opportunity is, it may not be so great. But I think we are at a a point within pharmacy where um, ownership is probably concentrating more and more, as in the same people are owning more of those pharmacies, I guess. Mm. There are absolutely models out there that are doing a really, really good job of distributing ownership effectively. You know, so there are groups where an existing partner in a pharmacy will will be the minor partner in the next part pharmacy that joins that group and the new partner will be brand new to the group and they'll be the major partner in their business. So they own more than 50% of it, which is a mm. good outcome as opposed to some models where you see them come in buying 15%. But the more, the more the pharmacists can move into these other areas where they're offering novel or niche roles and being able to um, market that in a manner to generate their income is, is great. Um, it, is, it is also important, just thinking from my um, professional practice point of view, it's very, very important that pharmacists, when they're doing that kind of thing, ensure that they are still practicing in a way that is um, completely professional and um, answerable as well um, you've got to make sure that if you're going to offer a service to clients that you are offering it in a manner that you have um, th that there are laws and regulations about what you're doing that cover you mm. so for instance offering an online service like Anna Barwick is doing um, is fantastic within Australia because she's covered by APRA and state and territory regulations and federal regulations if a pharmacist were to offer that kind of service and go outside of Australia and offering that advice and you accidentally breach a law in a country because that person that you're offering a service to is in a different country, then where do you stand? You've got to be really mindful about those issues and research them very, very well and understand the impact of them. And that's just the reality of working in a digital world where we can access every person on the planet, but we may not be legally or professionally covered for that you know mm. you'd want to be really really careful that let's say you're covered by an australian insurer mm. and you provide advice that is perfectly valid to somebody in another country but they access a product that you know nothing about because you don't know the manufacturing or scheduling standards in that country and they injure themselves mm. and then they decide to litigate you could have no defense perhaps so mm. um it's, it's it's one of those things with uh with new with new frontiers you're going to be make sure that you understand all the risks as well as all the benefits wow great advice thank you um we, we know that you're also a global lead for the international pharmaceutical federation yeah uh, working on continued professional development mm. can you tell us about that role and how did you get into it sure so um again membership through fip so um fip is is the best way to describe it, I guess, is the international version of PSA. Um, PSA is actually a member of FIP, but you know, I'm, a, I'm an individual member of FIP. Um, the opportunity arose uh, because the, so the continuing professional development and the workforce development sector of FIP had an expansion in what they wanted to achieve and they created um, 12, 12 sets of, um, of working groups, each with three people in it. Um, so I'm in number nine, which is continuing professional development. Um, it was basically an open call and, um, and I applied for it and, and was successful. The role is uh, intended to harmonize continuing professional development for pharmacists in all member countries. And so that sounds great, but it's far from simple because continuing professional development in a country like Australia is very well regimented and, and well understood, but continuing professional development doesn't even exist in some countries, let alone whether it's regulated or not. So um, at the start of my career, as 20 years ago, <laughs> CPD was not compulsory in Australia and there wasn't a standard that had to be met by providers of CPD. And there wasn't a standard for the 
current point system that we use now. Um, so all that changed, the APC, Australian Pharmacy Council brought in um, standards around that and it's been very, very well, well received and it's actually a really, really good process. Um, my working group is basically trying to, and it, it's gonna be a, a multi-year project, but we're trying to gather information about what the minimum standards are in member countries around the world. And then we'll work on um, providing an overview of what those standards are. And then from there, FIP can um, work with different countries and say, okay, you've got a pharmacist degree in your country from your university. Um, don't, you, don't you think it's appropriate to have a requirement for that ongoing pro professional development as well? By the way, he happens to be the model that's utilized in most countries around the world. And this is sort of the gold practice. We can help you implement this and, and go from there. Um, yeah, so that's sort of what it does. As far as getting involved is concerned, um, it's very much down to putting your hand up. Yeah, yeah I don't think that I um, am particularly more qualified or deserving of that particular role than anybody else. But um, I think it, it's just a matter of uh, applying for the role and being willing to be knocked back. I mean, there's a, there's a lot more roles that I've applied for in my career that I didn't get than, than the ones that I do have, so. Mm. Great. Next question is, what's your vision overall for the pharmacy industry in Australia? <sighs> there is a few, there are a few different things that I have a vision about. Now, I'm very, very privileged in that I work for an organization who happens to have a set of, of visions for the pharmacy profession and they align with what my own personal vision is for pharmacy as well, which is really fantastic. Um, you know, it'd be, it'd be horrible work for an organization who was like, no, no, pharmacists need to do less and mm. let's keep them, you know, working within this particular building type only and you can't do anything else outside of it. Mm. That would be a shame. Um, so one of my visions is that uh, the infrastructure for health and health information is improved. And I just happen to be working on a project that's part of that, which is, you know, electronic health, data, digital health. Mm. So electronic prescribing now is going to be improving communication. We'll have um, real-time prescription monitoring across the country it will be fantastic. We'll have real-time decision support tools coming over the next five to 10 years. We'll have artificial intelligence helping with um, decision support with facial recognition mm. for clients, real-time error reporting and, and, near miss reporting. Um, you, you may have heard of Melissa Sheldrick in Canada whose son died unfortunately from a, a selection error when a medicine was selected incorrectly for her son. So um, there's really good work being done out of Canada that, that can be applied across the world where if you have a, a pharmacist makes an error or a near miss, I've selected this wrong drug because of whatever factors, we can collate that and put it into a database and and start detecting, well, this happens a lot. We need to fix that particular problem so it's no longer an EMS or no longer an error. So digital enablement and, and infrastructure of pharmacy practice is one thing. The other area is the scope of practice for pharmacists is a, an area that I have a significant interest in. And what I mean by that is our undergraduate degree, our experiential training and our ongoing professional development mean that what we are capable of doing is significantly broader than what we necessarily have the opportunity to do in practice. Now, that a, a good example in Australia is vaccination. Mm. Now, vaccination is available to every pharmacist to become qualified in. That doesn't mean that every pharmacist wants to do it and not every pharmacist will do it. Um, medication reviews are currently a process to be able to do that. You know, you prove that you've got the knowledge to do it through the accreditation process, and then you can go and do HMR and you, and you continue to prove that throughout your accreditation process and ongoing. Um, there is a need for recognition of what pharmacists have the skill and expertise to do, and to ensure that pharmacists have the opportunity to include that in their practice if they so wish. Without, without everybody thinking, well, now every pharmacist is going to do X and they're also going to do Y and they're also going to do Z. So what we might end up seeing is pharmacists who graduate together and then 10 years afterwards, they're doing very different areas of practice um, as in addition to their base function of being medicines expert. And um, 
you know, there will be pharmacists prescribing within Australia within the next, you know, five years, I would expect, 10 years definitely. Um, we look at, at, in, at the UK, we look at Canada and pharmacists are doing this now and they've got a, a defined competence that they must achieve in order to do that. Mm. Not every pharmacist wants to go through that process, but those who do and those who can absolutely should have the capacity to do so. Now, systems in Australia don't recognise that effectively. Mm. Um, we, need to, we need to do um, better as a country at recognising what pharmacists can do. Um, we don't owe it to pharmacists to just let them do whatever scope of practice says that they could do, but we really should be making it less difficult for people to utilise their skills and expertise and their qualifications. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the two biggest things that I, mm. I see as a vision for pharmacy is that pharmacists working to their full capacity, unrestricted by artificial regulations. Mm. Again, I'll go to vaccinations on this as being an example. In Victoria, I can provide one type of vaccine. If I go into Western Australia or South Australia, I could provide a different one to people of different ages than I could have in Victoria. There's no need for those differences to exist. The states, understandably, have their own regulations. They create those rules based on what their need is for individual states. But we've gotten to a point with vaccinations by pharmacists where it's clear that pharmacists can do this effectively, efficiently. Let's just make it across the board. Every state gets together and says, OK, pharmacists can vaccinate banked up just like we've done with nurses. There's a really good document that outlines when nurses can initiate vaccinations, let's do it. Um, anytime uh, another health professional prescribes a vaccine or an injectable drug, there's no reason that a pharmacist that is trained to provide that couldn't be the person administering it once it's prescribed. You know, So there's a whole range of different things that pharmacists should be capable of doing and we're sort of <clears throat> held back, not by um, reasonable uh, regulations, but by regulations that just haven't caught up and haven't that have failed to understand the nature and expertise of pharmacists. So, yeah. So, very last question we'll always ask our guests is your advice for aspiring pharmacists. The biggest piece of advice that I have is that if there is something that you want, ask for it and be okay with the answer being no, mm. but continue to ask for what you want in all settings. So <clears throat> a, a really good example of that is the fact that I'm on three charitable boards because I put my hand up for it. There are maybe 10 others that I've applied for over the years, especially in respiratory health. So my early career in pharmacy focused very heavily on um, asthma. Um, I became qualified to provide spirometry um, at a time when there are only 10 pharmacists in the country that could do that. And so I have a very, very strong interest in respiratory health. And yet I've never been able to get into the um, respiratory bodies that I um, follow and, and engage with regularly, but I'm still not part of, you know, their committees or boards and things like that. Mm always be looking out for opportunities and go for them, even if you think you won't get them. And I think pharmacists almost have, in my opinion, we have a moral obligation to our own workforce to try and get as engaged as possible so that pharmacists are more visible to the wider community and to the wider workforce of health. And so that means for the primary health networks, they have both um, boards of management and they have clinical boards and those boards have opportunities and vacancies from time to time. So pharmacists should be watching that. Mm. And when an opportunity arises for the area where you live, put your hand up, get involved whenever they're doing research, get involved whenever they're doing, um, you know, surveys and, and other things like that. The more often you put your hand up for the things that you are interested in and make sure they're things you're interested in. Don't just put your hand up for everything you'll get you'll get jaded very quickly. Mm. But um, always, always go for what you want, even if the answer is going to be no. And if you get 100 no's and then you get a yes, the yes is always like yes. Mm. So, yeah. Wow. 
Wonderful. So thank you so much for your time. No worries at all. Thank you.